Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, a very, very warm welcome to the second day of Nobano Earth Weekend, the new festival, 2021. We started this festival out of Shanti Niketan in 2019, but the third edition, sadly, we had to opt for a virtual session, not ideal for any of us, but we're hoping that next year we'll be back in Shantini Ketan and able to welcome everybody to that beautiful place for the festival and the Domano Crafts Mela that accompanies the festival. In fact, the festival is part of the Mela. Before we begin today's program, I would like to start with a little tribute put together by one of our dancers, Alok Nanda Roy, who is currently recovering from COVID herself. She has done a healing dance, a dance of healing, which is dedicated to all the victims and sufferers of this pandemic. And she sent it to us as something to begin on a slightly um, artistic note just before we begin the festival. Alok Nanda Roy is not just an internationally acclaimed dancer, she is also a reformer of souls, She's worked with a lot of social projects, and she has a versatile style of incorporating many influences. She also happens to be Dr. Shadon C. Dutt's childhood friend's daughter and his cousin, Arjun Dutt's wife. The connection is particularly poignant because yesterday we began the festival with a tribute to Dr. Shadon C. Dutt, who is really behind this uh, the trust that presents the festival and it happens to be his centennial year and in fact his centennial birthday was yesterday so um yesterday was a special day for the inauguration of the festival we played this little video then and we'd like to share it again today this is a dance of healing Shushunar Boru Rani Gu Shankhu Kamul Kare Shushunar Boru Rani Gu Shankhu Kamul Kare Shumaluki Bushumaluki Thakumaluki
Let me um, jump straight into introducing our wonderful panelists today. Urvashi is a publisher and writer, co-founder of Kali for Women, India's first feminist publisher, now director of Zuban, another publishing house dedicated to women's uh, publishing. She is also author of the award-winning oral history of partition, The Other Side of Silence, Voices from the Partition of India. Urvashi is somebody who uh, speaks, writes, participates in uh, all sorts of activist and comment, uh, um, social commentary uh, programs around women and women's issues. Welcome, Urvashi. Thank you so much for joining us from Delhi today. The second person on the panel who I will introduce is Raka Shom. Raka is professor and Haran Family Endowed Chair in the Department of Communication at Villanova University of Pennsylvania. He held prior faculty appointments at London School of Economics and Political Science, University of Washington, and Arizona State University. She has published numerous essays and special issues in journals on topics such as post-colonial media studies, cultural studies, and the global south, Asian modernities, Asian mobilities, gender nationalism, gender and transnationalism, and whiteness. She is the author of Diana and Beyond, White Femininity, National Identity and Contemporary Media Culture that has been widely reviewed. Thank you for joining us, Raka. I Thank know you. that it's very, very late at night for you, and we really appreciate that you made the time to be part of this program today. Thank you. Karuna Ezra Parekh is a writer from New Delhi. She is known for her poetry, journalism, and activism. Her first novel, The Heart Asks Pleasure First, was released with Pan Macmillan India in 2020. She has a book of poems releasing with Harper Collins this fall. She lives in Calcutta. From working with TV as an anchor, to being a social influencer, to modeling, and all these things kind of weave together in her artistic and cultural and intellectual life. Thank you, Karuna, for being here with us today. Sandeep Roy. Sandeep Roy is ever my go-to favorite for moderating when I'm not trying to persuade him to be a panelist, of course. Shundeep has been a, is a journalist and writer based in Kolkata. He hosts the Shundeep Roy Show podcast and his radio dispatches air every week on public radio in San Francisco. He has been a contributor to many different outlets in India and abroad, from the New York Times to BBC to NPR to the Hindu, Printin and Economic Times. His debut novel, Don't Let Him Know, was well received. Sandeep, thank you very much for taking the time to moderate this panel for us today. And may I now hand over to you to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjum. And uh, maybe we can start with a little prayer to all the gods of Zoom and Wi-Fi that they are happy and will uh, stay with us for the hour. The way we wanted to do this panel, and let me welcome everybody to the panel, people who are listening and people on the panel. And thank you for asking me to uh, moderate this session um, at Nobano. Uh, the way we thought we'd do it, because we have people as Anjum's introduction indicated from such a diverse range of backgrounds and experiences, is have each of them give us a short presentation, talk, comments on what they make of this subject, rewriting the narrative, the nation, and today's Indian woman. Whenever we hear something like Indian woman, it sounds like a monolith. And uh, as we can see from the panelists, you know, they, they are, it's very diverse. And so it would be great, I think, to have each one's take on the topic. And so perhaps, um, you know, for the person who stayed up the latest to <laughs> do this, maybe we can start with Raka Shom. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to be able to join you all uh, from Philadelphia, where it is 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, my deep thanks to Nobono for inviting me. Now, my talk is about how the narrative of women's empowerment is being rewritten today under contemporary Hindu nationalism, 
in ways that are emptied of any feminist sensibility. That is any critique of patriarchal structures and issues of power. But I want to begin by providing a brief global reference for this topic by posing a question that actually animates my current thinking. And that is, how is right-wing nationalism today in various parts of the world employing the language of women's empowerment and rights in ways that are delinked from any feminist critique and are thus being easily accommodated into heteropatriarchal structures of nationalism. Um, in many European nations, we are seeing a confluence today of the language of women's rights with right-wing nationalism in ways that are reinforcing traditional boundaries of gender. And I can uh, speak to this more if there is interest in the Q&A. So my argument is that we are kind of seeing something similar in India today under BJP's Hindutva agenda. In 2018, when the Modi government faced a no confidence motion in the parliament, which ultimately failed, it began its defense by highlighting its seeming record on women's empowerment and argued that the government's Ujwala Yojana and Swachh Bharat schemes have enhanced the lives of millions of quote unquote mothers and sisters in India. The BJP government frequently pats itself on the back as being champions of women's progress, but what often gets obfuscated is how their logic of women's empowerment are reinforcing normative heterogendered boundaries and Hindu patriarchal structures. Now, I will now specifically comment on the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan program and its representational politics to discuss this briefly. Um, and from now on, I will use the acronym SBA to refer to Swachh Bharat so that you can follow me. I focus on the SBA because it is one of the BJP's pet program and where we often find the rhetoric of women's empowerment being espoused, Modi constantly refers to SBA. One of the goal of SBA has been to empower, is to compel rural village communities to build in-house toilets. The idea is that if you build toilets at home, then women do not have to go outside in groups to defecate in fields and can thus safeguard themselves from sexual violence. Now, on the face of it, this is highly desirable, but a closer look at the messaging reveals other problems. Let me specifically reference the No Toilet, No Bride campaign, which was initially part of the earlier Nirmal Bharat Abhiyan, but has now become part of the SBA movement. No Toilet, No Bride, initially set off in Haryana, although it has gone beyond it now. And families are encouraged not to give their daughters in marriage, to, and this is in rural, uh, rural parts, uh, to a potential groom who does not have a toilet. And Bollywood films such as Toilet Ek Prem Katha have reinforced such messaging. I am now going to show you two clips where these sentiments are expressed. So now let me toggle with share screen. So this is the uh, first one, first video. Kaki, where is the house? बहू को घर में कहा खुले में ही जाना पड़ेगा बहू फिर तो तुम घूंघट भी खोल ही दो एक तरफ तो आपको बहू का घूंघट भी सरकाना गवारा नहीं और दूसरी तरफ उससे खुले में इस तरह तो हमने कभी सोचा ही नहीं था तो अब सोचो घर में शौचालय बनवाओ और इस्तेमाल करो नाउ आई विल शो यू द सेकेंड वन विच इज एक्चुअली फ्रॉम अ रियल लाइफ सिचुएशन A woman refused to tie the knot with a man in Kanpur city of Uttar Pradesh after he failed to get a toilet built at his residence in time for the wedding. 
Neha, who had been married in a mass ceremony, pestered for the need of a toilet at the groom's house since the marriage was fixed, but the family did not keep its promise. Neha said that she was inspired to take the step by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Clean India Mission, which aims to create awareness among people for need of cleanliness at public places and use of toilets. उन्होंने कहा सोचाले हम बनवाएंगे फिर उन्होंने नहीं बनवाया और आजकल हर जगह गांव में भी आप देखोंगे सोचाले जरूरी है आजकल बजाय मंत्री जब कर रहे हैं तो पब्लिक को भी फायदा उठाना चाहिए इसी वजह से फिर हमने बनाया. She then got married to Sarvesh, who had a toilet at his house at a mass wedding ceremony organized by a local non-government. So what is the problem with such messaging? Now one problem is that many of these narratives acquire meaning against a framework of traditional Hindu marriage and cleanliness and domestic/family honor becomes linked to the bride's honor that reinforces traditional logics that associate and confine women to notions of purity decorum good behavior morality chastity and so on and thus the regulation of her body second muslim women cannot identify with such visuals which goes to a larger point that while sba frequently mobilizes gender it is organized often around the trope of a hindu woman around which narratives of cleanliness are organized we rarely see representations of muslim nikahs or any visual reference to muslim women safety and empowerment next that dalit women and muslim women do not enter into cleanliness narratives of sba calls out a larger issue that i do not have time to deal with in detail today that is it is hindu women's honor and body that get conflated with national cleanliness and purity and this is problematic in a climate where notions of hindu civilizationalism are being espoused every other day while muslims and dalit bodies dalit bodies who actually keep our societies clean are being excised and rendered as impure and unclean national subjects we also see how the home is being rendered a safe space for women and yet so much sexual violence domestic violence in india and elsewhere for women occur inside the home it is a shame that india is one of the 36 nations in the world today where marital rape is not legally recognized as rape because it is seen as a domestic matter thus making women the property of men post marriage with no agency over their body safety further this logic of women's safety and protection are at odds with the constant and increasing rapes and attacks of dalit women and increasing disenfranchisement of muslim women in the country today which leads to a larger question which women's safety honor dignity and protection is the nation concerned with today however problematically and how is that concern really reinforcing instead of upending traditional hindu heterogendered logics of being and belonging and this also clearly connects to issues around quote unquote love jihad where protecting hindu women from being usurped by muslim men is a pivot on which so much of hindu nationalist rhetoric revolves today and although i do not have time to discuss this point in any detail it is interesting to consider how all this might also connect to the rise of toxic hindu masculinity in the nation today thank you thank you so much raka and um let me now uh perhaps we can ask karuna to share her thoughts gosh hi um hi to everybody who's attending uh bright and early this weekend uh so you know when i was when i began thinking about this topic uh and i must also add that obviously my opinions are very much the opinions um coming from the experience of an urban indian woman though i am reminded in uncomfortable ways uh very often every day that the urban indian woman and the rural indian woman are often facing uh similar plights uh unfortunately but um when when i began thinking about this topic you know i it struck me that 
when you're born female in India, um, and perhaps in the rest of the world, but of course we're talking very specifically about our country right now, uh, I think just your birth uh, is, is the start point for rewriting the narrative. Uh, very often just being born or being able to be born as a woman in this country is where you begin rewriting the narrative. And um, I think we start by rewriting the narrative through our bodies. Uh, the experience of being female um, and of sort of charting your way through the world begins like that. So it begins with something as simple as uh, what you wear or who you meet, how late you stay out. Um, my, and you know, my entire life, you know, as, as you can see, I'm covered in tattoos. And I remember growing up, you know, the second I turned 18, I wanted these and I went and I, I went out and I got them and I saved up money and I started, you know, the, and I realized very quickly that um, for us, adornment is assertion, right? Um, and, and I thought so much about this as I grew up, but I didn't realize that this is me rewriting the narrative. This is me challenging it. So it started very much um, in my personal self, you know, to start rewriting my story and in that way, start rewriting the woman's story in India. And then of course, you know, it came to a point where we, uh, we face the internet and that is where, you know, I occupy the internet in a very big way in India. And um, I find it very interesting because I'm very political online as a lot of you may know, or if you don't know, uh, I, you know, I'm very vocal. I'm very, uh, I, I question the government very often. I put out my thoughts very vocally and I don't shy away from it. And very often what I've seen is, you know, we all know about the troll army that exists out there. But what I've seen is when the attack comes, it doesn't attack my viewpoint, it attacks my body. Uh, and I find that very interesting because um, and I think that links in very nicely for me with how, you know, we use our bodies to rewrite the story. And when the attack comes, it comes to the body. Um, it comes to the very physical being of yourself, right? Uh, so for example, the other day I had written something political and shared it online. And uh, this is what I wanted to find, yeah. So, and one of the, you know, there were many comments like this, but one of the comments that um, really stood out and I actually, remember it because I screenshot it and I posted it. And I think that man, um, I do think that actually uh, there's some kind of action being taken against him now legally. But the comment he left is, bitch, instead of spreading your legs, why don't you spread info? And I found this so interesting because, you know, it was, it was immediately like, oh, if you express a different opinion from mine, I'm going to call you a slut, you know? Uh, and, and I thought that was, it was so telling. And, you know, in the last two weeks, we've seen this huge uh, calling out of uh, comedians and uh, intellectuals when it comes to, uh, I don't know if you guys have been following the whole Mayawati, uh, this controversy about, you know, in comedians who made a lot of questionable jokes when it comes to Mayawati. And this is, they're pulling out material from about 10 years ago. And I was looking at all these jokes and not one of them criticizes, or very few of them actually criticize Mayawati uh, as a chief minister or as a politician. They immediately go to the body. They immediately go to fat shaming. They immediately sexualize her, you know? And, and this is violence. Uh, this, is, this is the most basic form of violence that we experience, you know, in, in the, every one of these comments, it is violence. For example, you've never, I don't think I have ever in the last uh, seven years, you know, seen a comment about how repulsive it would be to go to bed with Amit Shah, you know, uh, that just doesn't happen because, you know, the male body is, doesn't experience that violence usually, especially when it comes to the media. And so, you know, um, for me, it's very much about continuing to rewrite, you know, in everyday actions, you know, in everyday, whether it's, uh, whether it's choosing to wear a sleeveless top to leave the house, whether it's choosing to uh, stay out late, like I said. And then of course, there's, you know, 
there's, there's much bigger things going on now of uh, who even gets to call themselves a woman, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to question that. We're starting to give more freedoms to that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I think it's also a very crucial time right now, you know, as we become really woke and as the internet sort of explodes, you know, where, uh, especially with things like Clubhouse coming in and these discussions becoming bigger and bigger. So for me, I think we're poised at a very interesting time to see what's going to happen with this. And uh, I have to say, despite all the disappointments that one faces every day as a woman in this country, um, you know, from the home space to the public space, uh, it's never not a fight for us. That's something to remember. It is never not a fight. There's never, you know, it's never easy. Uh, but I'm interested to see what this new time brings. And especially, you know, I, I think what Raka, what he was saying is so true. I completely agree. I don't think, you know, there's any question of, um, you know, this, this Hindutva narrative of the pure woman and the pure Hindu woman and what she deserves and how, you know, that's being conflated with uh, freedoms for women when it's actually the opposite. Uh, you know, all that is so true. But I also think that the pushback is very interesting right now. And I think that pushback is going to rewrite things for us in a big way. Uh, I hope so, at least. Because, you know, I am seeing um, women who, uh, you know, used to be very silent about these things. You know, when, when you're pushed and pushed and pushed, at some point, you're going to start hitting back. Uh, so I'm interested and excited to see what this time also brings in terms of that. Um, sorry, this was, uh, I, this was just my thoughts on it. I don't actually have a presentation or anything like that, uh, but I hope that we can discuss this a bit more. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Karuna. No, I don't think you should apologize at all because I think it will raise really interesting points about what it means to be a woman now, especially online. So um, let me uh, ask Urvashi, to share her thoughts. Thanks very much, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Anjum and Nabana, for having me here. And I was delighted to listen to Raka and Karuna, both really interesting um, aspects. So like Karuna, I don't have a prepared presentation. I'm going to put before you some thoughts, which, um, you know, when I was looking at the subject, um, which came to my mind. And I think, first of all, it's a very interesting moment to be talking about this. It is a moment, as we all know, we've said, when the narrative of the nation is being aggressively rewritten. Mm -hmm. But um, it is also a moment when that narrative is being questioned by communities and groups who have consciously and deliberately been written out of this narrative mm -hmm. and who are now claiming it um, and claiming a stake in it and rewriting it. And I think from that point of view, it's a really important moment to have this discussion. I want to go back a little bit to, to look at the ideas of nations mm -hmm. and basically uh, to talk about uh, women rewriting the na national narrative or writing women into the national narrative, whichever way we look at it. First of all, I think women have never been written into the national mm -hmm. narrative they have never been an integral part of the communities that men have imagined as the communities that will form nations, uh, nor have they participated or been asked to participate in any significant numbers, so that those narratives uh, are narratives that are absent of women by and large. It's rare to have a narrative that actually has women in it. And in that sense, uh, the Naya Kashmir document created by Kashmiris in 1944 is a very interesting and unusual document for that time because it has a whole chapter on how Kashmir imagines its future and how women are imagined in that future, which is very unusual. It took the Indian um, five-year plans 25 or 30 years to have a chapter on women. So you can just see um, the, the comparison. And yet, despite their absence, in a sense, women are central to the national narrative. Mm -hmm. Central in the way nations are imagined. Mm -hmm. Bharat Mata mm -hmm. is very much mm -hmm. part of the currency today. Central in the way Bharat Mata is deployed, as mm -hmm. we see today, mm -hmm. often even to, to target um, victims of rape, as mm -hmm. happened in the Hathras case, mm -hmm. where 
anti-nationalism is used as a weapon against this poor Dalit woman. Mm -hmm. So she, you remember the accusations that were there of hawala money and money laundering, and therefore the family was anti-national against Bharat Mata, it was explicitly mm -hmm. said. And therefore, it was okay to rape her and kill her and mm -hmm. burn her without her parents being there. Also, with the uh, with the Patua rape case, it mm -hmm. was the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, with people claiming to protect Bharat Mata. And uh, so, in a sense, as many scholars have pointed out, women's bodies are often the ground on which Bharat Mata or the nation's masculinity is articulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because in order to, I suppose, assert that hyper-masculinity, you have to do it against something or something has to be there to legitimize it. And that usually happens to be the woman, the woman's body. So there is the woman's body to be protected, guarded, mutilated, all of those things, and the goddess woman who is there to be claimed. Uh, so, you know, during partition, for example, when the abductions, mass abductions and rapes happened, the entire discourse in both uh, sets of both countries in uh, the Constituent Assembly was a discourse among men about protecting their women, protecting their poverty, uh, property, and therefore protecting the nation. So I think that that's something uh, that's important for us to remember that that is how it gets articulated. Then I think, uh, and, uh, and yes, one of the points that, uh, that Raka made, and I want to reiterate that as well, that although we say women, it isn't every woman or it isn't mm -hmm. all women, it is the upper caste Hindu woman. Mm -hmm. So the other women get left out of the narrative altogether. I think also there is a narrative of protectionism. So, mm -hmm. you know, once you have integrated women in some way into the national narrative, then you have to ensure that they do not stray. And in order to stop them straying, you have to enact legislation, you have to imagine them as being located you have to imagine their citizenship rights. So it has to do with citizenship and the citizenship rights are very much located within the family. So she's mm -hmm. almost always ever a secondary citizen, mm -hmm. second citizen in the family. And as you, and that is the Hindu woman and the others don't have rights. So as we know from Love Jihad, mm -hmm. where the Hindu woman is being protected, as we know from the Hadia case, where the woman who converts is seen to be somebody misguided because mm -hmm. after all a good Hindu woman cannot ever claim the bad religion, which is Islam. Mm -hmm. So no matter that she's an adult exercising her citizenship rights, she cannot be allowed to be perceived as such. Can, that subversion cannot be there in, uh, in the national narrative. So women are kind of instrumentalized uh, to, in order to keep them in line. Now today, as we know, the national narrative is being rewritten, as I said, very aggressively. And it is true that narratives get questioned and subverted at all times. So if we just look at the national narrative of India independence and look at the peripheries of India, where the national narrative meant something very different. So in, in the Northeast or in uh, Kashmir and other places, so there it was already in the process of being rewritten in a different way. And uh, today we are seeing the rewriting differently. And here I want to look at um, some of the counters to this. So, you know, women of my generation who grew up uh, post-independence and who became involved in the feminist movement, um, we never actually gave the nation a thought except to be critical of it. You know, we, we almost like rejected the nation because it seemed like too, um, I, I don't know, um, it seemed like something we were not invested in. And so we kind of gave it up. But in a sense, um, questions began to be raised internally and ex externally within the feminist movement about this kind of rejection. And you see a change coming about. So I just mentioned one of the first times that uh, so-called mainstream feminists were questioned was by women from Kashmir, saying that, you know, for you, violence against women has been such a big issue, but you have never looked at what's happening to women in Kashmir because you have internalized the nationalist narrative and you mm -hmm. see Kashmir as anti-national. Mm -hmm. So when this anti-national articulation becomes really strong, this questioning also begins a lot inside the feminist movement and as the feminist movement is challenged from within, 
by Dalit women, by minority women, by queer women for its mainstream views. I'm sorry, I'm encapsulating years of history into one sentence. Uh, the ideas of the nation start to be both questioned and appreciated and so on. And then when we come to this present moment, um, then the, the resistance and the protest and the anger finds its way in the voices of those who are most marginalized, as in the anti-CAA, mm -hmm. as in the anti-NRC. Mm -hmm. I remember that when the anti-CAA movement was going on, I was in Kerala. One evening, uh, we set out in an auto rickshaw to find something to eat. And on the way into town, um, we, we were in uh, Kochi, and on the way into town, we heard on a street loud music and we saw a tent and we stopped and went there and it was a large gathering of Muslim people where young women in their 20s were singing on the stage anti-CAA songs. And so we stopped, we abandoned all thoughts of food and went and listened to them and they came and talked to us afterwards. And they said they talked as if they had a stake in the national narrative. This is something that's never happened before. Protests among middle-class young people who would otherwise have said nation has nothing to do with us, etc. During the CAA time, anti-CAA time, when they were confronted by right-wing people saying, you are anti-national, how did they react? They read the preamble to the constitution. They pulled out the national flag. They sang the national anthem. Suddenly, the discussions, discourse, subversion of the national narrative has begun in a completely different way. Among the young, among the Dalits who are refusing, Dalit women, particularly strong articulation, refusing to accept being wiped out of this narrative. Muslim women refusing to accept wiped out of this narrative. I don't know where this will lead us, but I think that this is a really important moment for us to mark. And then I just want to close by saying that there are actually ways and ways in which the national narrative gets challenged and rewritten. And even by the mere presence, visual presence of people who are otherwise invisible, as we saw in the first COVID uh, phase, when millions of workers came out on the street and initially the pictures of those workers were all men but over a period of time, those pictures became nuanced and you saw women and you saw the work that women were doing and you saw what ASHA workers were doing in villages and you saw what a &Ms were doing and you saw what nurses were doing. And merely by the presence of these people who are often on the margins of society, now in the public eye centrally, I think the challenge was being thrown to the national narrative. So we are at a very interesting moment. Really, that's all I want to mark, uh, to say that there are huge possibilities of reclaiming and uh, perhaps altering, or at least having a stake in the national narrative for women. What will come of it, I don't know. Thank you so much, Urvashi. And uh, thank you for actually raising that point that, uh, that we, you can rewrite in order to rewrite the narrative, you must feel like you have a stake in the narrative as well. So these arguments are not always, you know, also have to happen within uh, and not necessarily looking outwards. Uh, while all of you were talking, uh, one of the things I was, few things that just came to my mind, one of them was uh, this talk about the body and the attack on the body, and which is, of course, Right from the beginning, I mean, if we see a film like um, Earth, Deepa Mehta's Earth, it, it, we literally imagine partition as through the body of the mm -hmm. central woman character you know, being pulled uh, both ways. But does this mean that in a sense, and this goes back to the, the, uh, the toilet issues that Raka was raising and the points Karuna was raising, that uh, in order to rewrite the narrative, we would have to change the perspective on something that is very essential, obviously, which is women's safety, to talk about safety without necessarily turning it or making it synonymous with protection. So that is what we consider like protecting women as opposed to the safety of women. Um, anybody can address that. Maybe uh, Karuna, since you get a lot of trolling online, we'll 
at, uh, start with you. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, right? Because uh, because it's it's often so uh, the two things are often so confused, right? Um, and uh, there's all it comes down to this question of like is that you know and things like that, and it's it makes it somehow so uh, you know it, it's it's a way of reiterating a woman's weakness rather than her strength, um, and. Often, I think that, you know, I think of how women, especially in India, we always find strength in numbers, um, you know, and I, I, I love that, you know, and I think that what reassures me in this time is that, and, you know, when you look back at the independence movement and the freedom movement in uh, the 1940s, you know, when you think of the, the the names of women that come up, there are so few, you know, there's just these like few shining stars and, you know, amongst this sea of men, but that's not, that's not true. That's not actually what took place, right? Um, but what I find lovely about this time and hopeful also about this period is that I'm not hearing of singular women, you know, mm -hmm. I'm hearing of an army of women, you know, that we are all part of. And that kind of strength in numbers, I think um, that equates to safety for me. And uh, I think when we have that, we no longer require protection, you know? And uh, of course, again, I speak from a position of complete privilege, you know? Um, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, say a poor Dalit woman, uh, but I've also seen incredible stories coming out of rural India. Like we all remember the story of the, you know, the Gulabi gang, you know, and what women can do when they come together. Um, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of where my hope lies that there will be more of us. Uh, and yeah, I- uh, so, Karuna, one thing, I, when, since you brought up Gulabi gang, I mean, I think, and especially because our topic is rewriting the narrative, it's, it's sort of interesting to see what the documentary on that, which Nishtha Jain made versus the Madhuri Dixit film, which was based on the same story. And they, you know, and that is how the narrative gets rewritten in order to be more palatable to a wider audience, you know, the, the tropes uh, come in. So that's it's sort of an it's just interesting point. With, so Raka, in, in that sense, would you agree that that's, safety in numbers that the army of women that Karuna is talking about is actually the way a narrative like this can be rewritten. Um, I was listening to Karuna's comments and your question. Uh, you know, when I think of this, uh, first of all, the notion of women's safety uh, is not a monolith uh, at all. And that um, too often the notion of safety gets conceived through the middle class Hindu woman. And that, uh, you know, when Karuna, uh, you know, I understand you're saying that we are all part of this. Uh, I've, uh, while I appreciate where that comes from, and perhaps because of my own training in post colonial feminist thinking, I have always been a little. Um, have had mixed feelings about, uh, you know, this global sisterhood model, uh, because I know that a Dalit woman's need for safety or a Muslim working poor woman's need for safety is so, going to be so different than mine and my privilege uh, that I think that what I would want to say, Sandeep, is that uh, before even like talking about um, how do we rethink the notion of safety, I think so much research uh, needs to be done uh, to understand the vulnerabilities of Dalit women, of Muslim women, before even we can come up with some, uh, uh, you know, some narrative of safety. And that I think that having a singular narrative of safety is simply not going to serve us, you know? Let me uh, also put that to Urvashi. And Urvashi, since you brought up the, the topic of seeing these women protesting in Kerala against 
CAA. In a sense, CAA definitely for many people was an eye opener in the visuals that they saw women, Muslim women out there protesting for days on end um, with the preamble to the constitution, uh, reclaiming the flag. Um, mm. But what do you see, has COVID and the impact that it has on these numbers, literally, that uh, Karuna was talking about, pushed everything, this rewriting project, if you will, back because many women who were part of the informal sector, the kind of rights that they might have won over years are probably jeopardized or even lost, I assume, because of what has happened with COVID. Yeah, thanks, Sandeep. Um, you know, just uh, one small point, I think, uh, to your earlier question, thinking about safety, I think we have to think uh, uh, safety is an issue for everybody, and it is a, an issue in different ways for women. But I think we have to think of it not only in terms of public space, but also in terms of intimate home spaces, because mm -hmm. uh, safety there is, is one of the biggest issues. And uh, in terms of public spaces, to me, the move that Kejriwal made to make the metro rides free for women in Delhi was an amazing move because what it would end up doing was putting women out there in large numbers claiming public space. And that rather than putting lights and so on is uh, I think a very important uh, conceptual move. But of course, okay, I'll leave that aside in response to your other question. So I believe there are two things. One is, um, when women step out to claim the public space and when they become active politically and when they stake a claim to uh, now areas of knowledge that have been denied to them, something fundamentally changes. And uh, you cannot easily reverse that. You will lose something, but not necessarily the uh, what has been gained. And also, I think similarly, with COVID, yes, you're absolutely right. It has heightened so many inequalities and poor women have been made far, far more vulnerable. They have dropped out of jobs much more than men. I mean, the gender disparity has also become extremely evident. But I think knowing that, knowing the vulnerabilities and understanding what has happened to them, which I think many, many women are doing because there are uh, people working with women and women are recording their feelings and their solidarities and their histories in this, documenting. This would now will not be an absence. And that I think is a feminist contribution. Uh, will mean that we do have some knowledge with which to restart and perhaps it will not be so easy to push women back into um, into the depths of despair. Now, I said I'm an optimist, I'm a feminist and an optimist. So this is what I believe, uh, this is what gives me hope. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of that, and I wanted to uh, perhaps have Raka weigh in on this, is that, you know, we, we're, this Nabanda festival normally happens in Shantini Ketan in Bengal, which just came out of a very bruising and toxic election. And one of the things when you were raising the point of Mayawati earlier, Karuna, it struck me is that uh, so much of the vitriol that was the electoral rhetoric against the Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee was again about her body, about the fact that one that when she had broken her leg, you know, whether sh she should wear Bermudas or not, the Prime Minister doing the sort of DDO, DD cat calls. And uh, there was enough outrage and the usual people, you know, people said, oh my God, how can you do it? But what struck me was that it didn't make them stop. Uh, they continued to do it and they did it louder. And they, in fact, some of the leaders claimed that, that the people like us to talk like this because that's how they feel. So they, they, you know, they don't want to be couched in. Of course, in the end, the BJP did lose the election, but it sort of raises this question, Raka, you know, just as you say when that the uh, stories of Muslim women, Dalit women, all of these different kinds of issues need to be brought in. Can you rewrite the narrative without bringing in the women who are part of the right wing Hindu nationalist project of the BJP? You know, like, is it more important when these catcalls and things happen to 
hear from them and see what they want to say. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question, Sandeep, that, and it, you know, as I was preparing for this and my talk was actually from a book that I'm working on. Um, and I have uh, been seeing how so many uh, women, um, Hindu women, uh, have joined the right-wing uh, BJP, you know, uh, uh, the, the BJP spaces. Now, to your question, can we bring them into uh, our space? I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, the issue is not just a matter of including women. It's not just a matter of increasing the bodies. You know, it is a politics that has to be included. You know, so to me, it's never just about uh, having more female bodies, even though that's important, but the politics that they bring in, uh, the values that they bring in, are they anti-patriarchal? So can uh, right women who have uh, joined these right-wing Hindutva outfits uh, be brought in? Um, you know, perhaps unlike Urvashi, I am less of an optimist. And that I think that's a challenge because I don't know how you would uh, bring in women who are far more comfortable joining the right wing uh, Hindutva outfits into the kind of projects of women's safety that we are talking about. And this is an ambivalent answer, but I am ambivalent about this. Thank you, Raka. I wanted to invite people who had questions to send in their questions as well, and we'll try and get it to uh, it. So we have uh, one question where somebody says to us to talk about nationalism. Many countries' armies use rape as a weapon of mm -hmm. war to take revenge against the enemy. Mm -hmm. Is it the main reason why rape is generalized as a weapon and triumph, but not as a shameful act? Um, I, don't, I don't know who wants to take that on. Well. I mean, Urvashi, since you've, you've done the work around partition and, and some of the stories, perhaps you might take a... Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, I would say, I don't think that the reason why rape is generalized as a crime and not as a matter of shame is because armies or militias or in political conflict use it as a weapon of war. Um, I think rape is a crime. It is a crime. It's a, it's a crime. It's a violation of another human being's body and mind. And therefore, it is a crime. And it is a shameful violation, but it's not merely a matter of shame. So I would say that it has to be seen as a crime. Um, there's a question for Karuna. And it's as, do you think education alone is a superficial pass to tackle microaggressions given the kind of pyramid uh, structure of social sociological power that we have? Oh, gosh, uh, I don't even know if it's I'm too early in the morning for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer this. Uh, I don't know about education alone. I think education is definitely uh, a beginning to it. Um, but, you know, especially with what we've been seeing when it comes to cancel culture, uh, in, especially in the last few weeks in India, there's a lot of discussion about it. And, you know, some people are saying, uh, well, you know, instead of cancel culture, why don't we just call it call out culture? But it is essentially the same thing. And this kind of ties into what we've just been talking about in the last two or three questions as well, the concept of shame. Now, shame, I personally believe that shame doesn't work to change anything ever really uh, you know even when it comes to rape i'm not sure um of course you know the rapist should be shamed but shame on its own is not going to be the catalyst for change um you know i i personally don't believe that uh and of course there's the question of uh, who whose shame it actually is and we are still in a place where we're shifting from the shame being the victims uh to putting it uh, on the perpetrators and then, uh, you know, of course, uh, looking at what we can uh, use besides shame to educate. Um, but I'm sorry, I just wanted to also tie this in with what Raka was talking about. Um, sorry. Uh, but yeah, coming back to this, I do think that education is the start. Uh, 
but it cannot be the only thing and definitely what we're using right now which is the concepts of shame i don't think they actually work on their own is what i was trying to say sorry could you guys hear me yeah yeah we can we can hear you uh, sorry but what well, i mean this quite idea of shame i mean we are a shame based culture i mean that has been sort of the most potent weapon that people have used in order to keep people in line which sort of leads to the next question um we don't have very much time but let me ask uh, raka's views on this where uh, on one hand we, uh, we see women standing up for women on the other hand we often see how women are the one who are pulling down these women who are raising their voices against the wrongs it may be through moral policing outside of our home by strangers or inside our homes by our mothers in law or mothers at, at the same time so if you could um, you know what do you think uh you know uh that's a very good question and th these kind of questions often come up uh, i mean the first thing to recognize is that uh, women uh, are not outside of patriarchal values you know we are socialized by internalizing patriarchal values so it is not just the presence of a woman that makes a difference so women do pull women down but that pulling down has to be understood in relation to how women get positioned in relation to patriarchal structures right and that how in we inhabit the values of the patriarchal structure and use those values sometimes to relate to other women so the point that i'm trying to make is that uh, to assume that just because there are many women in a group is somehow uh, you know going to Uh, reflect the values of a group that are necessarily anti-patriarchal is not really the issue here. To me, it is always the politics, you know. And how do we, to use Gayatri Spivak's phrase, how do we unlearn as women the values of Hindu heteropatriarchy? It's not just patriarchy; it's heteropatriarchy to enact change. You know, we first have to unlearn what we've learned. about what it means to be a woman uh, raka so, i mean could I yes ask, go ahead. one time to it may yes, i yes please yeah. please i just want to ask the person who's asked this question and i see it's an anonymous anonymous question have you ever asked yourself why men turn against men mm -hmm. every war in society every battle every competition men turn against men we take that as normal when women do we take it as an aberration and blame the women for it please don't it's human behavior which sort of uh, leads to uh, this other question where this person is asking why are ed educated urban working women still so apprehensive about calling out abuse domestic abuse sexual harassment of their daughters etc is it still shame even in the post me too era but first of all i mean what do you thoughts do you think that is in fact true it's it's a very it's a large blanket statement we are making here karuna maybe uh, you want to take a uh, shot at it you know honestly i i personally feel that is that do we really have to ask that question i mean look at how look at how people who call out men are treated and you know we we constantly focus at, as a society we constantly focus on the one or two cases where we believe that the woman is using this to get ahead in her career or to gain attention uh, or to you know uh, get some kind of monetary gain out of it or get fame out of it and we always like to as a society we we paint that narrative i just i find it amazing when people say oh but you know why would a woman not call out for me the question is frankly why would women choose to go through that why would a woman choose to call someone out uh you know especially when like i said the shame becomes hers to wear it's never uh it's never her uh, ability to say shame him he did this mm -hmm. you know even um i'm seeing a lot of things come out uh you know even with the tejpal case right now you know of how uh how bad people are feeling for his family you know and uh, you know there's this other narrative that a lot of very vocal feminists have put out saying well he did this to his family she did not this woman calling out did not do that uh, and i think it's for me the question is not why why don't they it's I, i'm quite amazed by the bravery of the women who do 
if you ask me. Sandeep, can I yeah. just make one quick yeah. comment? I know yeah, we are ahead. almost out of time. Um, I find this question very interesting. Uh, is that we? It is uh, systemically we expect always the women, the woman, you know, who is being violated or who is being abused, to bear the burden of righting the wrongs when it has to be a systemic response. You know, family relatives around will keep quiet. In your office, if you're facing sexual harassment, everybody will keep quiet. So you individualize it to the woman who is the victim for her to right the wrong when it has to be a system that tries to right the wrong. You know, so that I find very problematic that the burden of fixing falls on the woman who is being abused. Thanks, Raka. And I think I would this point in terms of also the question is that when we say why are educated women who are still so apprehensive, in some ways, I think we're also othering it in the terms that, oh, this is to be expected of women who are not so educated, but right. educated women uh, must be more advanced in that sense. And it, it sort of goes back to what we started with is that we need to have all kinds of conversations within ourselves. But I mean, we could go on with this for much longer than we have, but we are already uh, out of time. So uh, let me thank um, Raka, Karuna and Urvashi who made the time to join us. And uh, thank you for um, asking me to moderate this Anjum and back to you. Thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Urvashi and Karuna. It was an honor to be with you all. Thank you, Raka, Karuna, Sandeep, Anjum, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Anjum and Sandeep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.